Good morning. Welcome to the bucket courses. Still the place to be on Wednesday mornings at 10 o'clock in Grinnell, Iowa. Uh, we are very glad you're here. I am still not Janet Carl. Janet is still in a warm place. But my name is Barb Lease, and I will do my best to fill Janet's shoes today. So here we go. Masks are welcome, but not required. Please silence your cell phones. Turn on your T-coil if you have one. If there is time for questions, Judy and I will come around with the mics. Please speak directly into the mic, and our speaker will let you know. You could, she may just let you raise your hand and ask questions at any time, and so we'll come with the mic. Coffee and cookies cost about $2 a person. If you're able, please consider putting some money into the big green donation bucket on the refreshment table. If you're able, please put your chair up after the program on the dollies provided. And there's dollies in the back, and there's several in the front. That would be appreciated. OK. Now for the main event. Dr. Liz Quetham of Grinnell College's biology department sees climate change as the biggest problem facing humanity today. Her two-part bucket course entitled, What Do We Really Owe the Future? Nature, Community, and the Climate Emergency will explore the global problem of climate change, measures taken thus far to combat it, and possible solutions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Liz Quetham. Oh, thank you, Barb. I think this is working now. Um, that was a great introduction. Yeah. Um, so the first image that we see here is sometimes called the blue marble. And this was one of the first images that really let us see how magical and alone the world is in which we live. Um, one of the things that you'll often hear people say at climate marches is that there is no planet B. And this is obviously very true. Um, but the actual, uh, part of the planet that holds the air we breathe is very small. It's a tiny layer that goes all the way across the surface of the planet. And you can see how thick it is relative to the size of the planet here. So we have a breathable, uh, is that too loud? No, OK. We have a breathable atmosphere, but there's not as much of it as you might think. And we've been dumping a lot of pollutants into it um, ever since the, the start of the industrial age. So as you know, um, solar radiation, let's see, I'm just looking for the, there we go. Um, I, I know that I'm repeating stuff that everybody knows, so I'll just go through this quickly. Um, it passes through the atmosphere. And most of it gets absorbed by the Earth and warms it, and that's a good thing, because this is the only habitable planet in the solar system or that we have any hope of reaching uh, within uh, a generation. Some of it is radiated back into space, but some of it is trapped um, by the Earth's atmosphere. And we are changing the atmosphere in ways that uh, make the atmosphere trap more and more of that energy. Um, CO2 is a really important greenhouse gas. Uh, others are even more potent, such as methane, which is released when we frack uh, for natural gas. So this just shows you some of the issues that we face today. And basically, here's a coal-fired plant. That is the devil in our story today. Coal is horribly polluting. Uh, other fossil fuels are also really horrible for the planet. They produce methane and CO2. And then some of the other uh, things that we do, um, industrial processes that we use, um, and then uh, 
things that we've done to change the planet, um, for example, the fact that permafrost in the Arctic is now thawing and releasing methane into the air, these are all things that are exacerbating this problem. Even if we didn't add any more CO2 as of right now going forward, the planet would continue to warm somewhat because of what is already there. So we need to get to net zero, that is where we're not producing anymore and at least stop doing harm. So again, fossil fuels are really the big story here in terms of the bad guy. Um, that is the single biggest cause of global warming. Um, and it, people will tell you, oh, CO2 levels, they go up, they go down. They haven't changed this much in 66 million years. That is a very long time, right? This is not a trivial blip uh, that we're seeing. So this just shows you, um, if you go back, so BP is not British Petroleum, <laughs> but it's years before the present day, right? So you go back 800,000 years and you can see that it's true that CO2 levels have gone up and down. And you can also see that temperature has tracked those changes very closely. Every time you see a peak in CO2, you also see a peak in temperature. So this is very clear evidence that these two uh, factors are causally related. Now, we've been adding more and more CO2 uh, to the atmosphere. So here is where we were in 2019. And you can see this is nothing like where we've been in the past, right? And if we continue to do this at the same rate going forward, this is where we'll be uh, 40 years after 2019, right? So this is not good. Uh, and if you ask, uh, some people will say, well, sure, this is going to happen in the future. We're smart. We'll engineer our way out of it when we need to. It is already happening. It's not like it's going to happen at some point in the future. It's happening now. So if you look at what temperatures used to be like in the summer from 1951 to 1980, here's where they were. And you can see the really hot temperatures are over here, cool temperatures here, average temperatures in the middle. So we're going to look at the deviation from the mean in these temperatures. So this is a statistical uh, analysis. And by the time you get up um, close to the present day, you can see that um, by 2015, really extreme temperature events that used to only cover 0.1% of the Earth cover 14.5% of the Earth now. So this is not a problem for the future. This is a problem through which we are currently living. Average temperatures in the Twin Cities warmed 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit between 1951 and 2012, and weirdly, winter temperatures warmed even more. It might sound like good news to you if you live in Duluth, but uh, as you'll see, that's actually not great news. Um, it, we're seeing higher variance in temperature in the winters and a polar vortex that can dip down much farther south than it ever used to do in the past. So in 2018, um, where a lot of my slides come from, there were at least 224 places around the globe that set all-time heat records just in that one year. Summer 2021 was the hottest such period on record for the contiguous United States. And this increasing heat can actually cause much more destructive storms than we have had in the past. So here you can see the oceans were the hottest ever recorded in 2022. And usually when the oceans are hot, it's that heat and the differential in heat between different places that drives the formation of storms. So you, how many of you remember Hurricane Harvey? It was a big deal at the time, right? And the reason it was such a big deal is because the water that it came across when it, we're up to seven degrees hotter than normal, and not just on the surface, but up to 200 meters below the surface. The hotter that water is, 
the bigger the storm. So you might ask, well, how is this going to impact hurricanes exactly? Well, first, warmer oceans tend to lead to more intense hurricanes. Secondly, those hurricanes become intense much more quickly, so people don't have time to find out how bad it is and get out of the way. Um, thirdly, again, this warmer air can hold more water, and so that means you can have heavier downpours during these storms. Um, the storm surges increase because the sea level is also rising due, due to the uh, melting of polar ice. And then finally, um, again, this jet stream that normally we count on to carry air in very predictable patterns across the globe is becoming more uh, erratic and wavier instead of going straight in around the, w the route that we normally would expect it to do. And this can also make a storm just sit in place for a longer period of time. All right, I'd like you all to get up for a minute, if you're comfortable, and find a discussion, whoops, sorry, a discussion partner who has the same first letter of their last name as you. Now, you can do this by going like, uh, oops, L or, you know, just saying the first letter of your last name, or if you know other people in the room, you can go to them, but this is intended to be a super short, like, movement break. So you're looking for a discussion partner. If you don't want to run all over the room, I mean, you can also talk to the person next to you. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> all right, so you can see I've, I've got a cartoon up here. I was looking at all these cartoons and they're actually not very funny. <laughs> they're too true, but you can see here's this person complaining about how his property value is being affected by the rising ocean. It's, and now it's wrecking my sign. So I want to know if you think that more people believe climate change is real today than they did 10 years ago, or if you think fewer people believe that climate change is real now. So discuss that with your neighbor. All right, if you'd like to raise your hand and report out, um, someone will bring you a uh, microphone. Probably Barb, because she's doing it all today. Thank you, Barb. So who would like to say what they think about this? There's not a right or wrong question, right? This is a question of opinion. Yeah. Oh, and Judy. Hello, I'm Dave. Hi, Dave. Uh, I do believe there are more people that believe that climate change is real mm -hmm. and I believe because there's a more awareness mm -hmm. and more stats on it and stuff and mm -hmm. I believe there's going to be more in the future. Right. So, good. Yep. That's good news to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, we have one hand back here and then you. We believe that uh, there are more people but there aren't enough yet. <laughs> That's such a great answer. We had a hand up here. Um, I know people who believe that climate change is real, but don't believe that humans have anything to do with it. Yeah. That makes me sad as a scientist <laughs> and just as a person, right? Anybody else want to report out? All right. Yeah, there's been a lot of disinformation out there, and we now know that fossil fuel companies knew a long time ago that this was going to be a problem, but they covered it up. 
right? They paid for studies and then they buried the studies. So it's not like we are suddenly finding this out. There, some people have known about it for a very long time and the people who have brought it into public importance, and I mean, in my view, they're heroes, right? So returning to this hurricane, um, there were places that received five feet of rain during that storm, which I did, that's hard even to imagine, right? Phenomenal. Um, people in nursing homes were trapped in flood wa waters for a really long time before they could get rescued. You can see what the water level is like in here. Um, and because oil refineries were flooded, there was further environmental degradation that took place because that meant that oil was now mixed in with, you know, raw sewage, which also floods when the water gets above the level of the sanitary sewers. Um, so it was a huge problem. And we're going to see more and more storms like this in the future, presumably. Oh, yeah? Oh, I heard, who, who knows Michael Mann? You know Michael Mann? Joan knows Michael Mann. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, and the thing is, when these things happen, the people who suffer the most are the people who don't have a second house and a third house and a private jet and, you know, the people who can't get away. The people who are the poorest are the people who suffer the most, always, right? But, and for climate change and storms as well. Best Pope ever, I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> that's just my opinion. Um, so um, January through May of 2019, that was the wettest period on record for the contiguous United States, that, and that includes Iowa. In Pakistan, in September 2022, just this past year, they had such terrible flooding that more than a third of the country was underwater. That just boggles my mind. I, didn't, I couldn't pick just one picture to show because it was everywhere and it was horrible. And these tend to be the places also where people live because people built cities close to rivers and close to the ocean. That's where a lot of big cities are found and those are the places that are most vulnerable to flooding, although no place is invulnerable anymore. So if you look at worldwide extreme uh, weather catastrophes, and here we're lumping together storms in orange, uh, floods in blue, and extreme temperatures, droughts, and fires in red, um, you can see how they've changed um, from 1980 to 2018. And it's not, and you know, sometimes there will be a little dip, but you can see the overall trend is that all of these things are increasing. So this is not a problem that's going away uh, anytime soon. Uh, because, and, and, and ironically, the same heat that makes air pick up more water and drives bigger storms in places where it's dry um, also pulls more moisture out of the soil. And so um, it's a case where we're seeing much higher rates of variation in the weather that we get. More flooding, more storms that bring a lot of water that we can't handle, yes, but also more droughts. And those droughts cause other problems. Um, this drought ahead of this winter um, was the worst in 10 years right here in Iowa. And hotter years typically, not surprisingly, have a lot more wildfires. And you've probably noticed that over the last 10 years or so, the frequency and severity of these has increased greatly, especially in the West, but all over the world. So um, the number of large fires has uh, increased. You can see the orange here is the fires and the somewhat lighter orange is the temperature. These are things that go hand in hand. So um, at the end of July 2019, there were 69 wildfires that were burning in Alaska. Uh, South Korea, um, and this actually, you can see the wildfire came into a city. 
Um, Colorado has had a lot of them. And the fire season is now 105 days longer than it was in 1970. The average area burned each year in California has increased by a factor of five. That's expensive, and there's loss of life. Um, so the three biggest wildfires in U.S. history have all happened in the last five years. So uh, you might remember the Camp Fire in California. I mean, it wasn't started by a campfire, but it's, that's the name of the area where it burned. There was a fire in the Bay Area. My um, son was in graduate school there for a while, and there were days when it wasn't safe for, pe they just told everybody to stay inside because the air quality in Berkeley and San Francisco was so bad. Um, and then the Dixie Fire in 2021. So we worry a lot about what's happening here, but we also worry about what's happening in other places. One of the big uh, things in politics that you hear about is having a border that is defensible. Obviously, the United States has a huge border with Mexico, right? And so, as you know, people you know, use this to score political points. But the fact of the matter is, we're going to see people leave where they are if they don't have enough to eat and they don't feel safe there. And climate instability is one of the things that is causing there not to be enough food in some places and driving, you know, motivating people to move from one place to another. So if you look at food surpluses and deficits between 1965 and 2019, you can see that North America actually does pretty well. So everything above this line is a surplus. Everything below this line is a deficit. Um, South America has been increasing. It's the food that it can grow. But you can see that Eastern Europe and the, the former USSR, it's kind of a mix. They weren't doing so well earlier, but now they're doing better. Australia is doing well. But in Central America, they have deficits, and the deficits are getting worse. Sub-Saharan Africa, same thing. Um, a lot of Western Europe, the same thing. North Africa and the Middle East, it's terrible. And the same thing is true over much of Asia. So it's not surprising that people who don't have enough money to buy things that are imported from other countries, they're going to want to go someplace where they can eat, right, and where their families can eat. And I don't think that's an unreasonable expectation. Um, but even here in the United States, we're starting to realize how sensitive the crops that we rely on are to heat. So if you look at the four crops that make up two thirds of the, all the calories that people eat worldwide, we see um, projected yield declines for each one degree centigrade of warning of minus 7.4% for corn, minus 6% for wheat, 3.2% for rice, and 3.1% for soy. So this is going to impact farmers. Now, I will also say that the companies that genetically engineer crops are looking at this with dollar signs in their eyes, right? And they're working on engineering crops that will do better under the conditions of the future. But at some level, plants need water, and they need to not be too hot, right? And so uh, it's going to be a hard problem at some point to engineer our, our way out of. Um, for every day during the growing season that temperatures go above 84 degrees Fahrenheit, corn yields go down by 0.7%. So you know, if we don't check this, by the end of the century, corn yields could drop by a third just from this heat stress. Plants have to open tiny openings called stomata in order to build themselves. 
and get uh, carbon dioxide from the air, but they lose water whenever they do this. And so, you know, if it's too hot, this becomes a big problem for them. And you, you might say, well, this sounds great. We're going to have a longer growing season in Iowa, right? Because the ice will maybe melt sooner in the spring. Um, but this can also mean that some of the insect pests that we count on being killed off by frost might be able to live here year round. Um, and there are plant diseases that do better when it's warm. So uh, people carried out an experiment looking at elevated CO2 levels and soybeans, and they found, how many of you have seen those Japanese beetles, like in your garden? Drive me nuts. Um, they're <laughs> both they and aphids were drawn to plants that were raised under conditions of elevated CO2. And beetles that were fed on those leaves actually lived longer and they laid more eggs. That makes me so mad. I, it's personal. Um, and this also lowered the plant's natural defenses. And so it was harder for plants to defend themselves against these pests. And then, you know, some uh, plant diseases like Asian soybean rust. Um, can uh, do better when winters are warmer. They don't get knocked back as much uh, during the winter. Um, how many of you have seen these uh, tiger um, mosquitoes? They're very stripy. They invaded here from another continent, as things do. And um, so that's a new mosquito species now <laughs> that we have in Iowa that's not as seasonal as other mosquito species and that can be active during the day and not just like at dawn and dusk. Th I, that also feels very personal to me. So water scarcity already affects a lot of the world's population. Not just water, right, but clean water, water that you can actually drink. There are places where people have to walk many miles to get water to drink and then carry it on their backs back to their homes. So if you look at how our annual water demands have gone up, you can see um, this, is, this is in order of uh, how much demand there is and China is at the top. So here are the needs of agriculture in blue industry in green, and then just what you know you and I would use and the city uses in orange. And you can see they've gone up a lot. Um, now this projects forward as far as 2030, but it started in 2005. So India, huge uh, amount of water is needed for agriculture. Um, so too in Sub-Saharan Africa, here's the rest of Asia. Here's North America, so our needs have gone up as well. So we're busily uh, pumping all the aqu aquifers dry. Um, Europe, South America, and um, I forget what this stands for, sorry. Um, thank you. Middle East and North Africa, and then Oceania down here. So, you know, water demand is not going down by any means. Okay, I think I got to our 10 minute break a little bit early. Is that okay? Was it gonna be at, it was gonna be at 10.40. Okay, people get a 10 minute break. So if you wanna go get a cookie or go to the bathroom. Now that you're really depressed, <laughs> it gets better, it gets better. Next week it'll be better still. Thank you. And now, once again, Dr. Kuitham. So this is actually something I've heard people <laughs> say. It's ironic. I mean, usually it's the other way around, right? People say, well, people just don't understand the long-term consequences of something that would be really fun to do right now. But here <laughs> it's like, people just don't grasp the short-term consequences of saving the planet, right? So, which, you know, 
if you see there's this is an oilman that's clearly saying this so um because in order to solve this problem we're going to need to leave oil in the ground and not burn it and you know companies that own that oil are not going to be in favor of that as a solution <laughs> so there are a lot of health consequences of the kinds of problems that I've been outlining for you. Um, and people have already been affected by climate change. It's becoming increasingly possible to say with a fair degree of certainty that a particular storm was actually caused or made worse in some quantifiable way by the way that we have caused the climate to change really extreme heat waves that people literally cannot survive if they are outdoors during them um, are going to become normal unless we really reduce carbon emissions a great deal. The heat index at the site in Iran reached 165 degrees in 2015. And that's just deadly. I mean, the thing about the human body is that the way we cool ourselves off is by letting water evaporate off of us, right? We sweat. Well, if you don't have enough water and it's hot enough, this is not going to work anymore. Or if it's humid, right? Because then the air is already full of water and you can't use evaporative cooling. So it's a lot easier to stay alive in the cold because we have clothes, <laughs> you know, but once it gets really, really hot, it's, it's deadly for people. Um, and the people who are most vulnerable to heat are the people who are also mo most vulnerable to the other problems associated with climate change. So people who are poor or homeless, um, people who are older and might have a little trouble thermoregulating, um, people who are very young and not uh, old enough to have fully mature um, thermoregulatory systems yet, um, people who have heart trouble or lung problems, um, people who are mentally ill, and finally agricultural workers and those who have outdoor jobs because it's not safe for them to go to work. And we already have some times when this is true here in Iowa, right? if you're a roofer, let's say, or you work in agricultural fields. It turns out that if you think about all the extreme weather events that were on that earlier slide, it's actually extreme heat that causes more deaths than any of the other things, you know, flooding, storms, etc. So um, another problem associated with uh, burning fossil fuels, of course, is air pollution. And this just shows you across the globe, it's color coded. The, c the more red the color is, um, the more deaths there are due to, due to air pollution. You might have thought that the US didn't suffer from this, but you would be wrong to think so. Um, we, there are a lot of people who die from air pollution in the United States. And the problem with getting people to understand how serious this is, is that there are deaths. It's not like getting hit by a truck where you might say, we need to put a stop sign there. It's statistical, right? It's because they had other respiratory problems, they were more vulnerable because they had had COVID. They no longer had lungs that function in the same way. And now they are more vulnerable. And People who live in places where the air pollution is worse are always people who are poor, people of color, um, people who might be red listed, right, from uh, buying homes in places that are better to live. Worldwide, this kills 9 million people every year. Sometimes it's really clear because the air is not clear. <laughs> like, it's really obvious. I mean, you see a picture like this, that air pollution is a very serious problem. Um, in 2017, you can see 1.24 million people died. That was 13% of all of the deaths that took place in India that year, in 2017. 
uh, air pollution is a huge problem in China. It's cut life expectancy by a little over five years in the north part of the country. Um, I took a trip to Beijing in uh, 2013, 2014, and everybody in Beijing had an app on their phone that told you what air pollution was like that day. Like it gave you an index of that, and people just wore masks routinely. Masks don't necessarily <laughs> help with the kinds of particulates, like with all of the particulates that they needed to worry about, but people understand that this is a problem. Um, you know, even uh, people at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences um, understand that this pollution index is really, really hard for people to live with. The mayor of Beijing actually said, Beijing is becoming completely unlivable. I noticed that that person is no longer the mayor of Beijing. But um, So um, I mentioned sea level rise and the problems that are associated with that. This shows you the changes in gigatons of ice in Greenland. And you can see, you know, there are seasonal blips. So in the winter, it comes back up a little bit. Then in the summer, it goes down. Winter, it comes back up. And it, so you take one step forward and then three steps back, you know, every year. Um, and this is a huge quantity of ice that can have profound effects on uh, the levels of the oceans around the world. Because once it goes into the ocean, it doesn't just stay right by Greenland, right? It, it goes everywhere. Uh, more of it is melting from the permanent ice sheet than from the glaciers that move back and forth with the seasons. Um, in the next 200 years, it could contribute as much as five feet to global sea level rise. Think about a coastal city that you visited and how it would have to change to deal with a sea level that was five feet higher than it is right now. This is going to be catastrophic. Um, and different places are going to uh, feel it to different degrees. This is just looking at assets at risk and not loss of human life. But you can see Miami is the, the top city in the world that's going to suffer the most from this. Florida it turns out, is flat. It's flat as a pancake. There's nowhere to go when it floods, right? Like go to the top of a hill. There's no hill there. So this is going to be a big problem. But also, other big cities, New York City, it's going to be a huge problem there. I mean, again, we build our big cities on the coasts and on rivers, and those are the places that will suffer. And it's, you know, it's an equal opportunity problem, right? It's all around the world. Here's a picture uh, of flooding in Miami Beach. I like this picture because I feel so sorry for that octopus. He's just like trying to cross the street like anybody else. And yeah. <laughs> um, this happens routinely now in parts of Florida. People just expect when there are high tides that there will be flooding. Um, it happens in other places as well. This is Norfolk, Vir Virginia. And the frequency of these high tide floods in the United States has doubled over the past 30 years, not surprisingly. A lot of real estate in New York City is, lies within flood zones. Um, and I think I dropped a couple slides that were about, um, that show, they were images from the big, um, hurricane that hit New York, uh, was it around 2010? And you could see water pouring down into the subway, right? It wasn't like it was just out, you know, let's say out here, like a little bit. No, like it went into the city itself and um, seminal parts of the city were actually flooded. Imagine a subway flooded. So, if we don't keep global warming below this level of two degrees centigrade, 12 up to 12 million people could lose their homes just because of sea level rise without considering any of the other factors that we've looked at here. 
fortunately, it turns out we know what to do to make progress with this. We need to change the way we source our energy. People predicted that worldwide wind capacity would reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. And they've, we've actually exceeded that by much more than this 20 times now. This was in 2018, right? Not just like by 20%, 20 times. Yay. So that's good. If you look at global wind energy capacity, you can see this only goes up to 2015, but this goes up like higher than that now. This was just the most recent um, image that I could find. And not only that, but people who are primarily poor and disenfranchised and live in countries that don't have a lot of money, they don't have an energy infrastructure that is already bringing power to their homes. And that means that solar and wind are the cheapest sources for new bulk generation of power and for distributed power where you see solar panels that are in a lot of different places. So if there's a storm, it doesn't wipe it out. Globally, there is enough wind to supply worldwide electricity consumption 40 times over. It's not like there's just not enough. Anybody who lives in Iowa knows there's a lot of wind. Um, and I mean, people will say, oh, but it doesn't blow all the time. It's like, yeah, but the times when it's not blowing are often in the summer, and that's when solar is really good, right? Because you have a lot of uh, the sun's rays beating down. So those two things with the addition of more storage for electricity are gonna be huge. Um, here's solar vo photovoltaic capacity, and you can see that has been rising dramatically. Yay, again. Um, and not only that, but the cost of solar has be also been dropping dramatically over this time. So it's much more affordable than it used to be, even without tax incentives. Okay, time for another short movement break. I'm going to make you get up again. Now this time you have to, oops, sorry. You have to find somebody with the same astrology sign as you. If you don't know what that is, you can just go the same birth month. Okay. So the point is not the same person you talked to last time, hopefully. You can see your friends anytime. This is a time for you to talk with other people. Oh, you guys are so grumbly. <laughs> it's okay. If you don't if you feel like you just got up a minute ago, you don't have to do it again. Mara's just showing off. She's even gonna take her coat off. <laughs> So I have a couple cartoons here, and I just wa wanted you to discuss with someone near you, which one of these do you think is better and why? I deliberately chose a really vague metric here. <laughs> better could be better for whatever reason you think, right? Either more convincing or really nails the topic or more likely to make somebody who is a skeptic think. Okay, who voted for this first one? Okay. Can you get a, uh, can someone get mics to the people who have their phone, their hands up? Put your hand up again. He's like, I don't want to talk about it. 
it's okay, you can talk. I've been up here yammering for like almost an hour. Okay, who likes, who, who thought this one was better than the other one? All right, we have someone brave back here. <laughs> I just thought it was more realistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> than the polar bear. Yeah. More realistic, because you hear people saying that, right? Oh, well, we're all doomed now anyway, so why should we stop burning oil? Because it could always be worse, that's why. But, yeah. What about this one? Who thought this one was better? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. I like that one because it's not, this one is political, clearly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's aimed at people who probably already aren't deniers. That one makes you think about, you know, why is it bad to be a dinosaur <laughs> <laughs> and a polar bear? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, they're very different, but I mean, they share uh, a certain grimness, right, that you see in a lot of <laughs> cartoons about climate change. Like, they'd be funnier if they weren't so true. Um, yeah. So I mentioned that the cost of photovoltaics is going down, and this just shows you, that's regardless of whether you look at residential photovoltaics, so that's the yellow line here. That has been dropped by 59% um, since the time when this slide uh, starts measuring things. Utility scale, that has dropped quite a lot, 74%. Um, um, wind, the cost of wind has even dropped like by 75%. And that kind of surprised me because there's moving parts with wind. And I don't feel like China has been like flooding the market with cheap wind turbines, you know, and that ha has happened from time to time with solar panels. But regardless, maybe the manufacturing has just gotten better. They finally have the technology down, but that has also dropped. Um, s storage batteries, the price of those has dropped 82%. And finally, LED light bulbs, that's the no brainer that it's really easy to swap out. They're so much cheaper and better than they used to be. So it's getting cheaper to do the right thing in the United States and in other places as well. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, we, we shouldn't restrict ourselves in our energy use because we have to compete with China. And until they are doing just as much as we are doing, I refuse to do anything. And to me, that's like a guy who's like the third heaviest guy in a lifeboat. And he's like looking at someone who maybe weighs a couple pounds more than him. And he's saying, I'm not going to bail at all until that person I, I feel is doing his share. Like the boat's going to sink if it has a leak. Everybody's going to go down. Like you are not benefiting <laughs> yourself by refusing to do anything until somebody else does something. So it makes me sad that so much of this is coal, but 53% of new capacity in 2018 was from solar and wind, and that percentage is higher now than it was then. If you look at India, that's another country that people tend to point at, look at them. That's phenomenal, so much solar and quite a lot of wind. I mean, they certainly have the sun. And in Europe, they're doing amazingly, right? Super well. Um, and in the United States, we're doing really well. I would like to see this drop because it burns very cleanly, but it also uh, releases methane when we get it out of the ground um, and when it's stored and it's, it's a problem. It's the cleanest burning fossil fuel. It is still a fossil fuel, but the solar and wind, that's fabulous. So again, it doesn't cost that much to just like get a solar panel and stick it up on your roof. You don't have to have power lines that run to you from a huge power plant. You can just power your laptop right now with a solar panel that you slap on the roof. 
So um, it's highly portable and really scalable. Liz, uh -huh. Liz I, I was curious about uh, earlier um, when we s saw the global ma uh, map, mm -hmm. what, what's the story on the African continent? Mm. I, I mean... You mean in terms of what they're doing with <coughs> cleaner energy and so on? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things where you're seeing more stuff like this in different places. I don't have a slide that specifically addresses new power plant development in Africa, but honestly, their consumption is so low that it's just going to be a blip. Per person, we're at the tippy-tippy top in the United States. So what they do right now does not matter as much, and because... These new technologies are become are so easy to put up. I I would guess that that's the bulk of what they're installing now as well. Great question. It's a big continent. Um, in China, um, in 2018, they actually installed more solar than any other country. So they did have some new coal plants going. Yes but they're working really hard to get solar in. And um, in India, same thing. They're putting up really big solar installations. So we need to be doing that too. It does take land, but you can put them on rooftops as well, right? So if we had solar on every rooftop in Grinnell, that'd be, yeah, Arizona, they're putting a lot of it up in Arizona, yeah. Um, so, you know, the thing is, there's a ton of solar <laughs> energy out there, and, and it is free. Um, just in one hour, we could power everything for a full year if we could really collect it all, right? Solar panels are not 100% efficient, so a lot of that energy that comes in does not con get converted into a useful form, but even so, uh, this, th we are not limited by the amount of energy that is flooding the earth. Um, and um, we really need better storage capacity. And this is a bit of a bottleneck right now. Um, say what you will about Elon Musk. He's developed big batteries that can store a lot of uh, energy. Um, but we need better batteries and we need to develop batteries where, you know, as you develop a new technology, as that starts to take over, then whatever resources that technology needs can become limiting. So if you have lithium batteries, where can you get enough lithium for all of the lithium batteries that you need? You know, so we need to think about those things and have a diversity of different technologies so we're not just counting on one thing that we can't do anymore if we use up all of the stuff that, that runs it. Regardless, um, energy storage deployments doubled just in this one year, um, and they are continuing to go up. I'll tell you more next week about stuff that's going on at the college, but the ability to use a battery to store uh, the energy from the solar panels that you might have seen them. The uh, solar farm has been put in just north of 16th. And all of that energy is going to come to the college. And um, there's a battery component to it that we can use to do something called peak shaving, where you put that energy, you use that energy during times when energy costs the most. And that's really key to making this work really well. More about that next week. But um, lithium iron, uh, lithium ion battery prices have also gone down, just like solar panels and uh, the cost of wind. And uh, in 2015, uh, Bloomberg View uh, wrote, solar plus batteries is set to begin a dramatic transformation of human civilization. Um, looking at vehicles, um, mainstream battery electric cars 
um, are uh, coming down in cost and they're starting to achieve cost parity with efficient fossil fuel powered cars. So um, I think, is it the Chevy Volt or the Chevy Spark that it, does it's it, it just doesn't cost very much to have an all electric car anymore. And I'm hopeful that that will be my next car. I feel kind of sad that I don't have one yet. But we also like to drive our cars into the ground. So, <laughs> um, but so, you know, it's getting cheaper to do the right thing over time than to keep doing things the way we've always done them in the past. There are lots of countries uh, that are planning uh, to phase out fossil fuel vehicles completely. Um, and not just countries, but some uh, states in the United States as well. Um, in the US, there's nearly five times as many jobs in solar as there are in mining coal. It's also a lot less dangerous to work in solar. Um, so if you think about how things have changed in the past and how that's affected life for humans on Earth, we talk about the agricultural revolution that made it possible for us to have cities and to have uh, larger uh, population growth. If you think about the Industrial Revolution, we were able to use machines to do work for us. And that really dramatically increased how productive we could be. If you look at the Digital Revolution, that has been incredible. Um, it's really affected the way that I teach at the college, but it's affected the way we do everything. Um, and it's the world is really just completely different as a result of the fact that everybody has a computer now. Um, if you might, you might say, I know somebody who doesn't have a computer. It's like, yeah, but they have a phone and that phone is a computer. They can search the web, they can do uh, calculations, they can do everything with that phone that only the best computers used to be able to do. And what we need now is a sustainability revolution to reorganize the way that we do things, the rewards and penalties around new forms of growth that don't produce emissions, that foster health instead of ruining it, that are fair and that are sustainable. And not just sustainable environmentally, but also sustainable from an economic perspective. Right? Because if people can't make money doing it, realistically, they're not going to do it, even if it would be better for everybody. And finally, from a social perspective, like those are the three pillars of sustainability. We can't just think about environmental s sustainability. We have to think about economic sustainability and social sustainability as well. And the culture wars that go on just hammer that point home even harder. So you might say, well, there's going to have to be all this regulation in order to make these changes happen, because that's the only way people are going to switch over to doing things the new way. But it's reaching the point where cost and economics are able to drive the kinds of changes that we need in order uh, to make these things happen. And according to Goldman Sachs in 2016, you know, a lot of us thought that the previous administration was not in favor of these things, but people kept working on them during that four year period regardless because they could read the writing on the wall, right? Regardless of who is in the White House, everyone is having to come to terms with the fact that this is a global problem that affects people here in the US. A bunch of states, um, the first ones were California, New York, and Washington state, but a bunch more states joined them uh, in a group called the United States Climate Alliance. So this was true during the period when we uh, were no longer signators to the Paris Climate Commitment. Um, California 
passed legislation that requires that by 2045, 100% of its electricity has to be carbon free. And the whole state, not just electricity, but cars, manufacturing, everything has to be carbon neutral by 2045. That's an ambitious goal, but that's the kind of goal that's gonna make it possible to get there. And at some level, I don't care if they don't make it by 2045, the fact that they're trying to get there and moving toward it as quickly as they can is the important thing. Um, the president that we had uh, at the college several years ago, quite a few years ago actually, um, didn't want to sign the American College and University President's Climate Commitment because we didn't know how we would get to net zero on our campus by any particular time. But um, Reynard Kingdon was, was w willing to sign that agreement, and even though at that time we didn't know how to get there. And I'll tell you the progress that we've made next week. But we, told, we had to tell them over and over again, nobody is gonna hold your feet to the fire. Well, for one thing, fires produce you know, CO2. <laughs> but, <laughs> but also, there's no like sustainability police that are gonna come and threaten to arrest you if you don't get there by the, that date. So, um, New York State said, well, we'll see your goals and we'll raise you. Like we're gonna be, whoops, sorry, 100% um, carbon-free electricity by 2040 and carbon neutral by 2050. And as you're um, probably aware, um, the current uh, presidential administration has set standards um, for reaching 100% carbon pollution-free electricity by 2035, um, which will be great you know, if we can get there. Even corporations are increasingly seeking clean energy purchase agreements. Some of the server farms that, you know, companies like Google uh, want to put in Iowa, they want to put those things here because Iowa has so much clean energy in part. And that's a big corporate win for them, you know, in terms of, uh, publicity. So there it is, our planet. We're doing the best that we can and uh, we have to change. I think that we will change and I hope you guys will all come back next week so I can tell you about uh, all the exciting stuff that's happening right now um, with the college, with the city of Grinnell, and with Iowa generally. I'd like to close um, with this quote from Wallace Stevens. After the final no, there comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. Thank you. I'll take any questions that people have. In your in the first part of your presentation, you, there was a slide that showed highest recorded temperatures uh, measured throughout uh, across the globe, and I think it was 2018. Uh huh. And it appeared that many of those locations were in the more temperate latitudes. I don't know whether that was a correct observation, but if it was, can you offer any comment as to why that would be the case? I mean, there's more land there, but also. It's kind of weird because the, the poles are actually warming faster than temperate regions, which is a problem because that's where the ice is that is melting, but there just aren't as many places up there where people you know, keep track of the temperature. There are more now than there used to be, but most people live in the temperate regions. So I think that's why the, most of those temperatures were there. Mm -hmm. uh, forgive my ignorance, but what does carbon neutral, what is that? I don't know what it means. No, that's a great question. So people use different terms to talk about how to fix this problem. Um, and carbon neutral means that you're not going to be using 
fuels that produce CO2 because that's one of the primary greenhouse gases and that is a uh, gas that has carbon in it and that is produced from um, burning fossil fuels that have a lot of carbon in them. So that's, uh, but it's, th people use different terminology. Some people will say net zero, you know, or they'll say no greenhouse gas production, which would also include methane and other stuff. So, I mean, you're right. There's like a bunch of different, there's a lot of jargon. So I'm glad you pointed that out because I'm sure, like with my students, if one person asks a question, there's usually at least five other people who didn't put their hand up, but they were kind of wondering that too. So thank you. Can you explain what the detrimental effect to carbon in the atmosphere creates or how it creates it? All I can tell you that it behaves li is that it behaves like a greenhouse, right? So um I mean, I, uh, long story short, I am not a physicist. So I've, I'm relying on the work that physicists have done and the I'm a biologist. So the precise mechanisms that produce that, I d can't tell you off the top of my head what they are. I can just assert that they are true and they're not controversial. Right? Every, people have known since Arrhenius' time that this he was a famous scientist who lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and he <laughs> he foresaw this coming, but he thought it was going to be great. It would be like living in a greenhouse, and everything would just be comfortable. Like He didn't really think about the fact that it might get too hot to support human life. So these are ideas that have been around for a, a very long time. Celsius is kind of the limit. Um, where are we currently at in 2023? How close are we getting to that limit? That's a great question, and I'll look that up for next time, because all of these figures that I've shown you, because we always think in Fahrenheit, all the temperatures are in here in Fahrenheit. I mean, because global warming is not constant across the surface of the Earth, I'm going to go out on a limb and say we might be there already in some places. It would not surprise me. And we've certainly, there was an organization called 350 that wanted us not to get past 350 parts per million of CO2. We are past that now. So, you know, it's a bummer. Uh, and And it's also an artificial barrier, right? Some people hypothesize that there are tipping points. Like let's say we go to the point where it's warm enough that all the ice in Greenland melts. That would be a disaster. I mean, if the sea levels rose five feet, that would be a disaster. But there's even more worse stuff that will happen if temperatures <laughs> rise more than that, you know? So I don't want to give anybody the impression that once we've hit that two degree level, it's like, well, that's it. We lost and just go home and like do stuff the way we've always done it. No, it will be much, much worse now, right? So I think people, it's, it's hard to know how to communicate about this issue because it's so big and people are, s we're so small. And you think, well, what can I do? I can't have any effect on this. This is a global problem. It is a global problem, but you can have an effect. And so by setting that two degree limit, I think people were trying to show everyone how close we were to a point that would have real effects that everyone would feel. So by that standard, we are already having those real effects, whether we hit two degrees or not. At two degrees, there are certain things that people predict will happen that will be worse than what's happening now. But then if we go past two degrees, it will be worse than that. So it's not like that is a hard limit where once it, nothing bad happens until we hit it and then past it, it's just uniformly bad. No, you know, it's graded, right? So that doesn't really answer your question, but. And you kind of covered that, but I was curious about what might be um, interpreted as a tipping point. Um, but obviously, as we, if we've gone, if we're two or have gone past that, as we continue, 
hopefully can still be turned around, um, but obviously as we continue to go, if we continue to go past that, then turning it around becomes a much, much larger challenge. And at some point, if the turnaround doesn't happen, then it may not be, you know, we hope we not, don't get to that point, but it may not be possible. Right, and there'll just be, and it's not like all life on Earth will go extinct. You know, humans might go <laughs> extinct, but everybody goes extinct sometime. I'm hoping it doesn't happen in my lifetime, but <laughs> kind of a bummer for my kids, you know, but, um, but, you know, it's just your quality of life, living life the way that we live it now will no longer be possible. And that's what, I think that's the weird draw that apocalyptic movies have for us, you know, that they let us um, imagine that, yeah, and experience it in a way that does not actually, <laughs> that we don't have to live through it, right? But we get to kind of experience it. Uh, another thing that's being done in genetic engineering, mm -hmm. uh, photosynthesis is very inefficient, and they're trying to design new plants that use a lot more CO2 and, uh, that may be coming up in the future too. Yeah, that's a great point. And they're working to, to do things like that. It's, I mean, we don't know what's possible. There might be things like, I mean, people are also, you know, they're like, oh, well, we're gonna keep making CO2, but let's just pump it all underground. You know, to me, that's just postponing the problem. What happens if there's an earthquake and then suddenly there's this huge eruption of CO2 into the air, you know? So plants are great. You've probably heard people say, God, I just wish there was something we could do to fight climate change that didn't cost a lot of money, you know? And that just fixed carbon in some way that was kind of natural. And that's a tree, right? That's what that is. It's not rocket science. And people have been working to plant more trees here, but I don't think we can get all the way there just by planting trees around here. If we could alter crops to make it so that they required l fewer carbon inputs, you know, like the um, fossil fuels that all the vehicles we use burn and so on, and making the um, uh, the stuff we use to fertilize them and the chemicals we use to keep them insect free. And if we could also make the plants fix more carbon, that would be great. And those plants would presumably also get bigger, right? Because that's what they do with that carbon. But I, I haven't heard that there are huge breakthroughs in that area so far. It'd be great if that happens. I wonder if you could address um, biomass as a fuel, because you've talked about solar and wind, you've talked about fossil fuels, and um, obviously big deal in Iowa with ethanol, but you know, algae, algae pr you know, produce fuels and, and such, and whether, whether they're a, you know, a solution, short term, long term, you know, good, bad. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that ethanol still produces, ethanol production still produces CO2, and that's one of the, uh, the businesses that currently wants to build a CO2 pipeline across Iowa so they can pump that CO2 into the ground. So even though it's made from plants, because it's so resource heavy in its production and its harvesting and so on, it's not really net zero, right? So, and, and the same thing with, like Colby College went net, z net zero in 2013 and Chris and I were like, what? how did they do that? Well, they started burning wood, you know, they're in Maine, there's a lot of wood there. Are they really replacing that wood at the speed at which they're burning it? I doubt that very much. Is it not producing CO2 when they burn it? Yes, it is producing. So there's ways that you can nominally get around things, but until the day comes that you're using biomass and replacing it at the same rate, you're not really, you know, fixing the problem. I thought your Greenland, talking about the Greenland ice fields have been shrinking. It's interesting what they found when those have shrunk back, they found green organic matter. So at some point in time, Greenland was not ice fields. It was, uh, you know, and, and they, project that there wasn't any ice on the earth at that time at all. Yes. And so those, those ice fields have been created uh, since that time in the last 1400 years, basically, 
but also looking, I think sometimes we look so, we get so focused on what's so close, we don't see what's farther away. You know, if we look at cyclical patterns, you know, in our climate and, and that sort of thing, if you look at from 1850 to 1900, we were in a global cooling period. Mm -hmm. Then from 1900 to 1940, we were in a global or a, a warming period. Yeah. Then from 40 to 72, which is not that long ago, we were cooling. The Earth was in a cooling cycle. Now from 72 till now, we've been in a global warming period. So just what all those, that cyclical thing has to do, those, change, those things have changed and have sped up and changed, you know, but it is interesting, you know, to look at those uh, cyclical events within our uh, ecosystem itself. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are other things that can affect how c hot or cold it is. But the big one that we know has been a driver, remember that one slide we looked at that went back like 500 million years into the past. When CO2 goes up, temperature goes up. Like those are those really, not the little fluctuations that go up and down like this, but the big ones that go like this, right? So there's always going to be some noise, like in smaller cycles that are taking place within the larger cycles. But that causal driver of CO2 in causing the Earth to get warmer is one that we see throughout the geologic record. So you're right. I mean, there are smaller fluctuations that go up and down. But the, the one that people are most concerned about is that link between those greenhouse gases and the temperature. Thank you, Dr. Kuitham, for your insight into climate change. Thank you. You guys have been amazing. This is really fun. I hope you come back next week. I promise it'll be less of a bummer. Uh -huh. <laughs> we definitely, definitely look forward to uh, seeing everyone next week for the second part of Dr. Kuitham's course, What Do We Really Owe the Future? nature community, and the climate emergency. Thank you so much, Dr. Quetham, and thank you for supporting the bucket courses.